And what we're going to do is we're just going to call ball script dot um, die, which isn't a function yet, but we're going to go ahead and implement that. And it will have to be a public function. And what's the ball going to do? Well, very much like the brick, which simply destroys itself, we could do that with the ball. However, however, it would be much better if all it did right now was reattach itself to the paddle, because that's the effect we're going to do. Um, well, there's a few different ways. We could have the ball die, and then the paddle script could just spawn a new ball. And maybe actually that's the best thing, now that I think about it. Let's do that. We're going to destroy ourselves. So first destroy our current game object. And then we're going to want to spawn a new ball. So for that we need we need the paddle, because what we're looking to do is we're looking to call spawn ball on our game paddle. Well, how do we get our paddle? Again, a few different ways of doing that. <clears throat> Probably the best thing here, at least the easiest thing in our context, it may not be the most optimal or expandable, is to just simply find our paddle. So in our, in our scene hierarchy, the paddle is simply called paddle. So we are going to look for this object by name. Another way of doing a search is to do it by tag, which is probably more optimal. But the ball dying doesn't happen very often, so it's okay if it's not the fastest thing. Again, we can optimize this later. So we're going to do a game object dot find paddle. We're going to find an object with the name of paddle, and we're going to store it in our paddle object like so. Oops. Although we don't really want the paddle object, what we really want is the script. We want paddle script. And really what we should do is have some sort of check here to make sure we got a valid paddle object. Um, but I'm okay with this throwing just like an actual exception when we get to this line and we're trying to access a null object because it would be, it's significant of like an actual sort of programming logic thing. There should never not be a paddle. Um, so we can, we can have it be a blatant error for now. Uh, and if we need to sort of couch it around some sort of test later on, because maybe there is some sort of valid, semi-valid state where this could come up in, and we'd want some sort of user feedback, then we'll deal with that at that point. But for now, this just sort of thing should be fine. Um, so we actually want this to be a paddle script. And then paddle script, oops, not object, but script, dot spawn ball. Ah, no match, probably, because it is not public. There it is. So, the ball should die, and it should spawn a new one. Let's give that a try. So we start with a ball. Make sure there's no errors in our console yet. Good, looking very nice. And fire, and the ball dies, and then is immediately attached over here. There is a bit of a glitch. When we do instantiate the ball, it does come in in a stupid spot. So, if you recall the paddle script, I changed the instantiate code to just instantiate it and not care about the position but we're going to want to put that back in. So we're going to return this bit of code right here. And I'll put it in parentheses. That's really not necessary. Let's do that. And then quaternion.identity. We're going to put that back in. So when the ball spawns, it spawns in the right place. So that way you won't get a flash. You may not have been able to see it on YouTube, but there was a flash for the spawn. There we are. Good. Now, obviously, we don't want the death field here. This was just for testing purposes. We want our death field to be directly below our play field, right around here. So now, if I go and launch the ball and then move my paddle, boom, it dies, and we start over. Good, well, it's it's all, that was kind of a weird bounce pattern, wasn't it? Something may, may be slightly off with something. Only play will tell if we've got anything in our physics model that's gotta be tweaked. So at this point, really what we need is maybe a lives counter and a scoreboard, perhaps. And for that, we're going to start messing around with the GUI. Now, I'm going to keep the GUI in this example, and GUI stands for Graphic User Interface, and some people just say GUI. I'm going to keep the GUI extraordinarily simple, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One, I'm not particularly artistic, so my ability to make a really nice looking GUI is, is not fantastic. Uh, secondly, the basic GUI tools in the game in Unity are not necessarily the greatest thing in the universe. Um, a lot of people end up using a fantastic add-on called NGUI, so literally N-G-U-I. It is available in the App Store, um, or not the App Store, my bad, the Unity Store, which or the Asset Store, which you can access it here. Um, there is, I think, a free version as well as a commercial version, unless I'm wrong, and it's very likely that I am. 
Furthermore, there's a few other um, there are a few other packages for GUI out there, and there's plenty of ways to customize the built-in GUI. But more importantly, sometime after Unity 4 comes out, Unity will have a brand new GUI system uh, built in, which looks really cool and quite sexy. Um, so all that comes down to I'm going to make something very very simple. Anyway, our game is very very simple. So there are a couple of approaches, a couple of major approaches to using the built-in GUI code. Um, one way is to simply add a game object to the screen. Um, for example, GUI text. Right. So now we have a piece of text. I'm just going to uh, to move it. Oh yes. Now the the coordinates on the GUI text are a little bit different. Um, they aren't sort of screen space coordinates. They are more like this is the zero x and this is one on the x. So it goes on your screen. So if we wanted something positioned in the bottom left corner of our screen, we would set x to zero and y to oh zero. The zero zero is down at the bottom. If I set y to one, you can see it's at the top. If I set it to zero, you can't see it at all because it's just slightly below the screen. And the reason is because it's anchored on the upper left corner. The sort of um, the origin of the text is the upper left corner of the text block. So we're actually going to want to set it to the lower left. And now you can just barely see it down here. Now it does have one slight issue in that it is anchored literally on a screen space basis. So here it's going to be overlapping the game screen, here it's off to the side, which might not be the end of the world, except, of course, for the fact that um, it sort of blends in incorrectly here. So really, what we want is something a little bit different for our implementation, but I'm going to keep going with this just for the moment, just to demonstrate how it works. So we have this GUI text object, and we're going to rename this as um, Lives. Or, actually, I'm going to rename it to GUI Lives, like that. And then the text is going to start off by saying lives, something like that, some sort of placeholder. I'm going to make the font bigger. I realize it'll make it a lot easier for you guys to see uh, font size, which is zero, which is kind of odd. I guess that just defaults to the, bait, the default font size, which seems to be around a 12 or a 14, maybe. Um, I'm going to go ahead and make it all the way to a 20, so you should be able to see it a little bit easier. And I'll also bold it. There we are. Right, so everyone should be able to see that just fine. It also shows up. Um, in both the scene view and the game view, and if I rotate around, you can see it's definitely stuck there. It doesn't it doesn't follow the rest of the game. It's a 2D plane on top of the rest of the interface. So how will the lives work? What controls the lives? I don't know. The paddle is kind of the player, so I'm tempted to just add it to the paddle script, and I guess that's what I'm going to do. So we're going to go and set um, make an int called lives. I'm going to start it at three. That's pretty classic. And um, actually, we'll start it at four. And whenever we spawn a ball, we are going to remove a life. Pretty simple. So um, we're going to start with one ball in play and then three extra lives. So you have four lives in total. Now, we also need to update the GUI. So for this, well, what I can do is something like game object dot find GUI lives. I think that's what I called it. GUI lives, yes. Um, and I can chain this with get component. I want to get the component called GUI text is the thing I care about. Um, so we can do something like GUI lives like this, which is a GUI text. And then GUI lives dot text equals lives plus lives. There we have it. Start you off with three, and if I do this, and go down, it's going to kill the ball, it's going to spawn a new one, and take away one of my extra lives. Well, that works pretty well. Again, this, what we probably want to do is actually kind of cache this by putting this, say, in the start. So we're only running it once, and then what we want to do is make that like that. Okay, and we could also check to see if this is a, a valid object before we start doing things, but again, um, that's not something that's going to happen in-game logic. If you don't have the GUI lives thing, you actually want like some sort of game-breaking error that just stops the game in development and say, hey, what did you do to the GUI lives object? But this will still work. But now we're only grabbing it once, and technically we're slightly more optimized, except that I'm lying because apparently I've made an error. It's because I'm, I was calling spawn ball before this. There we are. So now GUI Live is going to be populated. We're going to have it cached before we try to spawn the first ball. And there we have it. So now we're in good shape. And again, if I leave this off here, we're going to lose a life. It's going to respawn the ball. 